yes, this, uh, this next paper is, is based on some research we've done um, just recently. Uh, and it's come about from uh, the last few years uh, and uh, on occasion uh, been asked by clients, um, how can we achieve a, a zero carbon building for, for this site? And, and in fact, uh, about 10 years ago, we were asked to provide a zero carbon precinct in the middle of the city. And we did the numbers and it was quite interesting to see what the, uh, the numbers actually told us. So um, from then on, we, uh, we thought, well, we'll look at it and see what, um, what we can do. And, the question first comes in, what, what does a zero carbon or a zero energy building actually look like? And when you think of it, uh, you, your first impression is that it, it's probably a building which is going to be naturally ventilated, it's a building that's probably got some solar panels and maybe a few wind turbines on, on board to generate electricity. But I would argue perhaps that it probably looks like this. I mean, this building is zero carbon. It's actually got a lot of embodied carbon in the wood that it's made out of as well. It's naturally ventilated, naturally lit, and works very well. But of course, it doesn't particularly solve the, the service that it re it's required in today's, uh, in today's cities. Um, but it, it could also look like this. And of course, this building was built uh, in Melbourne uh, many years ago now by Grocon. And this building is a zero carbon building. This, uh, this building uh, has got a five star, oh, sorry, all the points in Green Star, all the points in Leed, and all the points in, in Briam as well. But of course, it's a small building, um, and it's got a wind turbine top, uh, and it doesn't particularly uh, serve uh, larger cities where we've got large floor plates, of course, which uh, a lot of our developers require in order to house tenants all the way through. So the question comes, can one of these buildings be zero energy or zero carbon? And of course, buildings like this, they're sealed. They're sealed up, and as soon as you seal a building up, you need to provide ventilation to it. And as soon as you need to provide ventilation to it, then you need to, just by the full law of physics, you need to force that air through the building which consumes energy. Once you start getting a fairly deep floor plan, you need to uh, have um, light within the building. And so lighting uh, consumes energy. It also generates heat, which needs to be cooled, which means air conditioning systems need to be installed to overcome that. And of course, the people inside of it, working busy, busily away, generate heat as well, and their computers and all that needs to be offset as well. So they, they, they end up consuming a significant amount of energy just because of their own um, existence. So if one of these can be zero energy and zero carbon, well, what needs to be done to do that? Can one, of, can, can one of those be located in a city, and can a precinct actually be zero carbon? And what needs to be done in order to actually make a precinct like this zero carbon. How many PV cells, how many wind turbines, what sort of strategies would you need in these buildings, all of them, in order for this to be able to be cut from the grid and be standalone zero carbon or zero energy? What we did, we actually took a test case. This, uh, this test case is a building which is in North Sydney. Uh, the building's at 177 Pacific Highway. It was um, developed by Leighton Properties, um, built by CPB. Um, and typically it's 40,000 square metres, it's 30 storeys tall. And uh, it's got a number of strategies which we'll have a look at a little bit later to provide it a very low energy opportunity, uh, or low energy performance. Um, and it's been operating now for the last 12 months. And it's actually operating very well. We'll go through that in a little bit, in a minute but it's not zero carbon or zero energy. The foyer there you can see on the right-hand side uh, is a mixed-mode foyer. It provides natural ventilation when the ambient conditions are quite mild, and of course Sydney's climate is a very mild climate. Uh, it breathes. Uh, it's also got some um, in-floor heating for winter time, and it's got some displacement ventilation when it really gets hot outside. So it doesn't use a lot of energy on the, uh, uh, from that perspective. But the building itself, of course, has got standard air conditioning systems. And typically, the building's made up similarly of, that, similarly, uh, of those systems. Uh, you've got plant on level three, chillers which serve air handling units on, on level three and, le and level 31. Those air handling units on level 31 serve down to level 18 and from level three serve up to level 17. And of course, we've got boilers on each of those levels serving just those local air handling units. And the reason we've done that is because we didn't want to pump water all the way around the building all the time. Uh, cooling towers on the roof, of course. Um, 
the low temperature VIV system, it's got low static air handling units, so what we've tried to do is make sure that the, build, the air handling units are very lazy, so they don't have to work hard. Very low uh, speeds across the coil, so we've oversized the air handling units. And we've also used plug fan technology. So one of the main things we looked at here is that recognizing that buildings primarily operate at part load, your building has to operate very efficiently at part load and not necessarily at peak load. Got low load chillers, got low load boilers, uh, coolers, uh, cooling towers which can, can be staged down, and uh, a multi stage tenant condensing water system which can be staged down as well and still operate very efficiently. Um, and then for those little areas at, uh, that run 24 7, like the security office and places like that, rather than having the chillers and the cooling towers and all the pumps operating, we actually just have little local um, direct expansion systems, a bit like the residential type systems. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, high efficiency lighting, although at the time we did T5 lighting, fluorescent. Today, if it was built, it would be an LED system. So how easy is it to achieve a, an energy car a, a zero or a, car, a, 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 carbon, a net carbon zero building? Well, first thing, we need to look at where, where the energy is, um, how much energy it's using. And you can see there, the red is, is the electrical uh, energy, the gas is the, the, um, the yellow, and of course, a little bit of diesel oil as well. What we've tried to do is convert that into one currency. So we converted it into um, carbon emissions. And there you can see that most of the carbon emissions is actually from electricity. And we've tried to use that throughout for the rest of the study. And what's that made up of? So when we actually look at the, air, the, air, so look at the energy consumption in the building or the carbon emissions in the building here, air handling systems are around about a quarter. So the fans pumping the air around the system is a, a, about a quarter. The chillers is about 20%, 18%. And then you've got a little bit of base building lighting and then lifts and escalators and then chill water pumps. That's where, so if we're looking at reducing the energy consumption in this building, that's where we need to, to, uh, to, 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 to pay attention to. When we actually took this building, we had to compare it to make sure that we're not starting at a very poorly performing building. Um, and what we've done is we, we've charted it against all of the data that, uh, that the neighbours uh, website has on, on buildings, commercial office buildings in the Sydney metropolitan area. There's about 325 of them, and this is the energy intensity of all of those buildings. It ranges from about 1,400 megajoules per square metre down to uh, just uh, below 200, 270 or so, uh, 170. Our building actually sits there. So, just from a base building, it actually is already performing very well. And the next step is to say, well, what do we have to do to take it to carbon neutral? What we did is we model it, and, we can, and you can see there, that's how the building's performing. That's the base building, that's the air conditioning, that's the, uh, the lifts, that's the, the tenancy lighting and such like. Sorry, it's not the tenancy lighting, it's the base building lighting. What it doesn't include is your, your, um, your computer equipment and your lights of your tenants. And what we said is, well, what would happen if you put 800 square metres of PV on the roof? And that's what it did. It would reduce the energy consumption by a small amount. So you thought, well, that's fine. Why don't we look at maybe putting uh, another 5,500 square metres of PV on the spandrel panel, panels around the building? And what would that do? And of course, remembering that the sun will only be on your spandrel panel or on your, your one facade for half the day. You still get some energy generation from diffuse light, um, diffuse radiation, but uh, it's, it's not that great. So what does that do? Assuming that it's about 12% efficiency for the PV arrays overall, it does that. So it's a li little bit better performance, but it's still not, um, not that great. And what happens if you actually covered the whole facade with glass, which uh, was to perform uh, and, and pr pr provide energy uh, and, and generate energy. Well, you'd get it down to there. So you're starting to get down towards the carbon neutral, but you've still got a long way to go. But the problem is, is what about the light, tenants' light and power? Now, the tenant lights and power, if you were to include that, you would actually go back up to there. So you've actually got all of that is tenant lights and power, and this is your base building energy, and that's your offset energy there. So you're almost back to square one, if not worse. So what we said is, well, let's just have a look at this a little bit further. 
If you were to do 20,800 square metres of PV on the roof uh, and the facade, and you wanted to make your building PV, uh, uh, carbon neutral, you would need not only an extra 12,000 square metres, not 24,000, not 36, you would need an extra 48,000 square metres of PV around your building. So basically what you're saying is you probably need a precinct. But are there any other opportunities to reduce energy consumption? Well, knowing where the energy consumption is in fans, in chillers, in lighting, base building lighting and such like, we looked at where the technology is now taking us, what the future potentially could hold. We know that efficiencies over the years of a number of different services like boilers has gone up to over 100% now using condensing boilers. We've got variable speed drives, which are a lot more common, a lot more cheap, uh, cheap to manufacture and install, and also becoming more efficient with our electronics. LED lighting has probably done the best thing for us in the last few years, where we've gone typically from 12 watts per square, or in fact 25 watts per square meter with incandescent down to fluorescent down to, uh, of, of, of 15, down to T5 of around about nine, and of course now we're around around about four, three or four watts per square meter with, with LEDs. They've made a huge difference. High efficiency magnetic levitation chillers, or bearing chillers. And of course, plug fan technologies. It's all increasing the efficiencies all the way. And what we've said, well, what happens if we push those and just take those charts a little bit further to 2020? How would our building perform? Well, typically, if we started off with our current building and then we had a condensing boiler, well, you can see that little bit of a dotted line at the very top. It makes a very little difference in the carbon emission reduction. If you had a high performance facade where you actually made your building that didn't leak, that didn't have any thermal conductivity and didn't allow any solar gain coming to the building, the energy consumption, at least in the Sydney climate, would actually be very small as well. And if you increase the, silla, the chiller uh, coefficient of performance, the efficiencies of the chiller, from a typical um, IPLV of 12 up to, say, let's say, a theor theoretical value of about 20, what difference would that make? Well, it would still make a small difference, but it wouldn't get you to carbon neutral. If you start to have really low energy laptops, uh, that starts to make a bit of an impact because there's so many of them. They're giving out some heat, the chillers and the fans don't have to work so hard. And of course, if you reduce your lighting too from the six and a half watts per square meter to about two watts per square meter, then you're starting to make some inroad there as well. But when you combine all of those up to one building which can incorporates all of those strategies and you add a PV uh, on the roof and the facade, you're actually then starting to get pretty close to a building which is uh, sitting at um, um, carbon neutral. But you're still not there. We still need more, um, more um, energy reduction or more energy generation. And so if you look at our building again, let's just say we, uh, we, we clad it again in, in 20,800 square metres of PV on the roof and the facade. So how much PV would we need now? Well, you'd need around about 12,000 square metres of PV on the roof and uh, in, in the facade. So you're still looking at a precinct solution in order to get a, a carbon neutral building. I haven't had a look at wind turbines on buildings. Generally, wind turbine build, on, turbines on buildings, especially in urban environments, um, don't generate enough power to provide any sort of a, an impact on the buildings. And the main reason for that is the amount of disturbance of, of the air passing through the urban environment. Um, but uh, it gives you a bit of an indication of the size. And so, so if, if, if you look at that for taller buildings, our building is sitting at around about 150, square, uh, 150 metres above floor level. Uh, so it's about 147 metres all up in height. A lot of the buildings which are getting taller and taller are getting higher and higher uh, as we go through, as, as buildings come online. Uh, and as you can see there, that we're going, is, as buildings become taller and taller, we're going to need more and more precincts. And we're, ne we're going to need these precincts to help power our, um, our buildings if they are to become carbon neutral. So when you look at the, uh, the, the, the data from using, uh, with using um, the current technology against the, the uh, future technology, you can see that as your building 
height starts to increase from 1 to 5 to 10 to 20 to even 160 metres, the current technology means that your area for, let's say, a 30 uh, metre high, a 30 storey building is around about 50,000 square metres of, of, of area, of PV area, at the current technology. And as the buildings get taller, as you could expect, the amount of area that you require to make that, that building um, carbon neutral uh, increases. But with the future technology, with a 30 storey tower, it's around about the 20,000 square metres, and then increasing as the building gets taller. So there is opportunity, but there's still a long way to go. So it does actually suggest that the future for low carbon buildings or zero carbon buildings is, uh, is that we need precincts. But there's an issue with that as well, and that comes down to the, it comes down to the economics as well. It gives opportunities for, uh, for developers uh, who have tall buildings to actually use some, uh, if they've got a, a repertoire of, uh, of different buildings, for example, light buildings and uh, sorry, uh, low rise buildings and tall buildings, to be able to use some of those lightweight roofs uh, that you have in some of the more suburban districts to actually uh, lay some of those um, PVs on some of those roofs and generate electricity to then offset some of the power which is being consumed by, by the, uh, the tall buildings. But the problem is at the moment is that the, the economics suggests that uh, what happened at the moment, when you, when you generate electricity from a PV in your home or anywhere else, you're actually selling it to the grid, to the utility providers at about five cents per kilowatt hour. And the problem is with the buildings, when you're buying electricity from the grid, it's costing around about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. So the economics don't work up, don't work out. Until just recently, and there was an opportunity that just came up in, in, the, in the news just a few weeks ago about a new company called Powerledger. And it seems to be something that may be a disruptor for the market of, um, of electricity and using of the grid. There is now an opportunity to use blockchain technology so that generators of electricity with PVs on their houses or on large scale buildings can now actually trade that electricity with buyers uh, and that be, they, be, they could be uh, commercial buyers or industry and actually trade that, that, that uh, electricity through uh, blockchain, blockchain cryptocurrencies. So it all of a sudden there's an opportunity now that you may start to see that the, um, the, 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 the grid the utility type system will be bypassed from the perspective of the, of the actual uh, transaction. It's now, I understand this system is now actually operational and uh, we may see that this is starting to disrupt the, the industry even further. So how will, it imp uh, how will the green grid impact the building design? Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, for many years, um, we have actually looked at designing uh, more and more efficient buildings, buildings that use less and less energy. Uh, the neighbour system has come in to, to, to try and uh, encourage us to design um, uh, buildings that use less, uh, consume, uh, emit less carbon emissions. Uh, by use of either PV or cogeneration or tri-generation. But once we have a green grid and we know that there is no carbon emissions that are being generated from our buildings from the, genera from the consumption of, of the energy off the grid, will that change the way that we look at how we design buildings? Will it really then be an issue on further pushing the envelope of buildings and making them more and more energy efficient? Uh, or will we start to realise that a green grid will actually allow us to then relax our, uh, our pursuit of, of uh, more and more uh, energy efficient and uh, carbon neutral buildings? And it's something that we need to ask ourselves, what then will become the driver for the next generation of buildings? Are we going to be looking at something else to uh, keep us pushing forward for this new technology? Mm -hmm.